Hey everybody, uh, James Wall here at Wall to Wall Martial Arts and I want to just give you a quick explanation of what this video is. So in this video you're going to see the techniques that we require here at our school in our rotating curriculum for a teenager or an adult, so it's ages 13 and up, to go from white belt to yellow belt. In our adult, press, uh, adult program, that's a four month period they have to learn these techniques and become proficient with them. We don't mean expert level, but a basic proficiency. So um, this is a, a great video to accompany the instructor level uh, course that we offer uh, to kind of go over. It actually includes more material than what's typically going to be covered in the instructor level uh, seminar or outline, but all the techniques on the instructor level outline are included in this video uh, plus additional items. So this is not something you have to utilize, but it works well for us here for taking a white belt beginner, getting them up to a certain base level, in our case getting the yellow belt and ready to work in with the rest of the class. So this is the teen and adult white belt to yellow belt material in our adult curriculum here at Wall to Wall Martial Arts. Again, this is an excellent video to watch along with the instructor level outline and instructor level seminar that you may have uh, one of our instructors come out to teach at your school if you're looking to start a judo program. Hey guys, this is uh, Sensei James Wall at Wall to Wall Martial Arts. We are here today to record and show you guys the yellow belt uh, technical requirements for our adult or senior judo curriculum. I've got a couple of my senior black belts here with me helping out today on the mat first. It's going to be Sensei J.W. Didier. It's going to help me out with demonstrating the throwing techniques and then after that we'll work on uh, the pins and escapes and chokes and joint locks and miscellaneous mat work for you guys. Uh, a couple of things about these videos that we're going to be working on. Number one, um, understand that with judo techniques of any kind, there's lots of room for variation. So I'm going to be showing you sort of the standard way that we go about teaching these techniques to people here at our school. But uh, variations are perfectly acceptable. So you could line up three or four judo black belts and they will all show you the same technique in a slightly different way. So you may see things maybe just slightly different. As long as the throw is fairly close to what we see here and it's recognizable as the correct throw, you're going to be okay. You don't necessarily have to do it exactly the way that I do it. Uh, another note is that when we start teaching people for white belt moving to yellow belt, we do all of the throwing techniques from just a static position. And by static, I mean that we take our judo grip here and he puts his right foot forward and I put my right foot forward and then I simply step in and perform the throw. So there's no big body movement happening. And it's perfectly okay when we test them for yellow belt uh, to do all of the techniques from this static position. However, once they are past yellow belt and they're moving up to orange, green, brown, we do expect and we really would like to see the throws done with motion of some sort. Um, so today we'll show the techniques from a static position, then we will show them stepping back and forth, and then we'll also show them moving in a straight line or in a circle depending on what the technique is. Now there may be a couple of techniques along the way with this video curriculum that we will demonstrate only from a static position or maybe from a what we call a rondori type entry, a more dynamic entry. So not every throw lends itself to being demonstrated in a straight line, a lot of them do. The main thing to get from that is that we need to develop the ability to do these throws in a dynamic moving environment, not just from a static standstill position. That's just the learning point that we start from and we want to improve from there. So let's get right into the throws for the yellow belt set. First one is Osoto Gari, the large outer reap. I'll be showing all the throws on the right side versus a right-sided opponent. So we will start with our right feet forward. I have a grip on his sleeve and on his lapel. And when we're practicing throws, learning in a technical environment, I will also allow him to have a grip on my lapel and my sleeve. Uh, this is not the way we would throw in a rondori or competition setting, simply the way we throw for training purposes. So, Osoto Gari, the large outer reef. So what we see here is I have my grip and my right foot is forward. I drive in with my left foot and step in line with his two feet. 
Now there's two major variations or two real major different ways I see this throw demonstrated and they're both perfectly correct. The way that I do it is as I step, I tuck Uke's elbow in and then push his shoulder back. The other main way you'll see this demonstrated is instead of tucking the elbow, I'm actually going to drive the elbow back behind him to create the off balance. This is perfectly acceptable and a lot of people do it that way. So if you've learned it in that manner or it seems to work better for you, you're A-OK. -okay. It's alright to do that. So for me, I step with the left foot and drive his elbow in tight. I push his shoulder back to create off balance and it's important that I keep my head looking down. I don't want my chin to come up. My balance goes backwards when that happens, so my head stays down. Now my leg comes through, I point my toes so my leg muscles line up straight and strong and then I reap back of my knee to the back of his knee or back of my calf to the back of his calf to finish the throw here and let him fall. The next evolution of that throw for training purposes, maybe around the orange belt level, we'll step back and forth with each other here. And usually we'll have them time it so that on the third forward step, one, two, now on three, I step in when he steps forward, break his balance to the rear corner, leg through and reach to finish the throw. So again, we wouldn't start the students out doing that, be a slightly more advanced version once they've gotten the basics down. And then lastly, we would do it with us walking backwards and our uke walking toward us. Just like that. So that was Osotogari, large outer reef. Next throwing technique will demonstrate the same way. It'll be Ogoshi, the large hip throw. So starting from a static position, right arm around his waist, right leg steps forward. I pull up and forward on his elbow as I turn and put my back to his front. Notice there's no space between our bodies. My balance is forward. My chin does not come up. My feet should be about shoulder width apart, not a wide stance here. I'm going to bend my knees, pull him onto my hip, rotate, and let him drop. It's important to note for our curriculum, that right arm behind his back, I'm hugging his waist and hip, but I'm not grabbing his belt. For us in our system, if we grab the belt, it technically becomes a different throwing technique. So don't allow your students to grab the belt, have them hug the hip instead. Let's see it with some back and forth movement. One, two, pull, and lift. Three, and now moving in a straight line. So that was Ogoshi, the large hip throw. Our next technique will be Ippon Sayanagi, the one arm shoulder throw. This is probably the most uh, common judo technique that almost everyone has seen in some form or another. It's still a very popular competition throw even today. Right arm underneath his armpit. It's important to note that I'm not placing his arm onto my shoulder. Instead, I'm clamping here with my bicep and forearm. Left leg steps back. Again, my legs are close together and I've got good body-to-body -body contact. It's really important you watch for your students and make sure that they aren't here creating this space. The throw is probably going to fail. We want to be very close and very tight. My head is down and forward so my balance stays forward, not back. Bend the knees, hips go out, lifting with the legs. Then push and let him drop. Now, I do this throw with a push of the right hand. It's perfectly acceptable if they grab the gi. So some people will go through, grab the uniform here on the shoulder and bicep, then turn, then pull. 
it's perfectly fine to do it that way. If they're slack in the gi and we can get that grip, it's a great way to do the throw. So either way is fine. Let's see it with some back and forth movement. One, big pull, two, pull, fit in, and throw. And now moving in a straight line backwards. That was Ipon Sayanagi, one arm shoulder throw. Next throw is a close relative to that one. We refer to it as Seoi Otoshi. Now, this is more of the sport version of Seoi Otoshi, the drop knee shoulder throw. There is a full classical version, Seoi Otoshi, which is a lot different. I'm gonna be showing you the sport version, what we recognize in our curriculum as the drop knee shoulder throw, Seoi Otoshi. The entry is exactly like Ipon Sayanagi, but when I'm here, I drop to both knees. Notice how I'm deep under my opponent's body. A lot of beginners will drop here, again, leaving this open space. This is not going to work. They must be under their opponent's center. Pull sharply down, and at the last moment, I'm gonna look back toward my left foot. So it's down and turn at the finish. Let's see that again. Now back and forth movement. Two. Pull and drop for three. And now straight line movement. So, Seoi Otoshi, the drop knee shoulder throw. All right, last throw for the yellow belt set is Marote Gari, the double leg takedown, or we could say the two-handed reap. Um, there are lots of variations of this throw, particularly if you or maybe some of your students have a strong wrestling background. So I'm gonna be showing you the very basic version that we do for promotion and testing purposes at the yellow belt level. If you already have a version of this throw that's very, very effective for you, uh, by all means use it as long as it's recognizable as this technique. So, from a gripping position, I have to break the grip, so I drop my hands down, circle out, and then I'm gonna blast my hands through very quickly to try to break this grip and this grip. As my hands blast through, I'll step in with my right foot and put my shoulder into his belt knot or his belly. So I blast his grip and step real deep. I'm aiming to get my hands behind his knees. Now it's important that your students are not looking down at this point. We don't wanna get their head and their face smashed into the mat. We also don't wanna leave them vulnerable to a guillotine choke right here. So as we enter, we wanna put our head up above their belt on their hip and into their ribs, and we're looking up. I tell my beginners to look at the ceiling. Grab behind the knees, we're gonna lift him up, and then drop him straight back. So it's up and back, just like that. Now again, there are lots of different variations, spinning to the side, and tripping with the foot, and things like that. This is the very basic version. Another thing I wanna point out, since we primarily work on and practice freestyle judo, in freestyle judo tournaments, we could not attack with this throw from this type of distance, what we refer to as a wrestling style shoot, or I drop to a knee from a far, far away distance. In freestyle judo, I need to either be gripping him, or at the very least, we need to be engaged in grip fighting. We need to be here in this range, okay? And maybe I've only got one grip here, all right? But now I would shoot in and deliver the throw. Now, Marote Gari is one of those techniques that don't work particularly well, back and forth movement, or straight line. So we typically just have the students work on it from a static position and then in a more Rondori type setting. So we saw the static position with the grip break, a more Rondori or dynamic setting could be that we're just here fighting for these grips and I shoot and make the throw work like that. All right, those are your five throwing techniques for your yellow belt set 
for our uh, senior or adult curriculum. So work on those and uh, let me know if you have any questions. All right, guys, so we're gonna go over the pins and escapes that are in our senior or adult yellow belt curriculum. Uh, there's only two pinning techniques here. They're pretty basic. So we're gonna show each pin and then we're also gonna show two basic escape techniques from each of them. Uh, when we test someone for yellow belt, they typically have to know the pin and they have to know at least one escape from each pin. Um, in the case of these two escapes, there are some basic textbook style escapes. If you have other escapes that work well for you, it's perfectly okay to use those. In a judo context, if I am pinning my opponent, if he can just grab one of my legs with his two legs, basically half guard, that breaks the pin. Uh, I don't have to let him go and, and disengage, but the, the hold down timer is no longer running, so I'm no longer earning points for the pin. So we could just do a leg entanglement, get half guard or even full guard, that stops the pin. He could throw me off of him. He could sit up completely and keep his back off the mat for at least three seconds, or he could turn all the way over onto his stomach and it's no longer a pin in that case either. So uh, we'll work on these uh, two pins and show you two escapes from each. I got Sensei John King, one of our senior black belt instructors here as my partner for this segment. So let's get started with the uh, pins for yellow belt. Our first pinning technique is Kesa Gatami. This is uh, the scarf hold. You also will sometimes hear this referred to as Hon Kesa Gatami, H-O-N, which just means normal or standard scarf hold. We just call it Kesa Gatami. I'm gonna sit in real close under his armpit. I'm gonna put my right arm behind his neck. I'm gonna have his right arm trapped under my armpit. And it's important that my hand is behind his elbow. So I want to be clasping his tricep or even here under his armpit, but I want to keep control of the upper part of his arm. If I just hold him back here, he can bend that elbow and he has a lot more power to escape. So it's important that we clamp down here by the tricep and by the armpit area, and I want to clamp it down tight. My right hand can be on the mat or it could be grasping the gi, whatever you prefer. But remember, we will maybe uh, in a Rondori setting have to be able to move this hand from here out to here if we need to stop him from bridging us over. So legs are wide, my head is down low, and I'm clamping in real tight, and I'm really focusing my pressure on his chest and trying to keep his shoulders pinned down to the mat. So the first escape we'll see from here is what we call a bridge and roll. So you're gonna see Sensei John turn on his side. He's gonna get real close to me. He's gonna clasp me with both of his hands here. He's got both of his feet real close together. He's gonna to push me forward to load me onto his shoulders, then bridge me across, just like that, at a nice steep angle. So it's very important to note that he is not trying to throw me from this side of his body straight across his waist or across his belt to the other side. He is definitely throwing me at an angle. So let's see what that looks like without me there in the way. He would grab tight with both arms, feet close together, bridge me forward onto his shoulders, and then from one shoulder over to the other shoulder. All right? Next escape here as far as basic escapes is what we refer to as an uphill turn escape. So I'm in my standard case of Gatami position. He is again going to turn to his side. He's going to put his free hand on the back of my head. And he's going to push hard and fast. His objective is to put my forehead down on the mat. So he pushes hard. And as he pushes, he starts to move and pull his arm free. And notice that he got his knees underneath his body. It's important that he establishes this base so he will have power in his core to pull himself out. Let's see that one again without me talking. Just like that. All right, our next pin for a yellow belt, our next hold down is Yoko Shihogatami the side locking four corner hold. Now this pin is one of the classical traditional judo pins. 
you will see, still see it used in competition. However, um, with the, the prevalence of grappling arts and styles these days, you do have to be careful with this because it does leave you somewhat vulnerable uh, to chokes and arm bars if you're facing an opponent who is very skilled on the ground. But it's important that we still teach it and that we still uh, have it as part of our curriculum. It is part of the traditional judo ground fighting. So I'm going to be here on my knees. I want my knees to be spread wide, and if possible, I want them in contact with his body. I'm going to go chest to chest, put my upper arm behind his neck, and my other arm is going to reach across, and it's going to go very, very low under the opposite hip. I'm going to show it from this angle, and then we'll also turn so I'm facing the camera. So this arm behind his neck, this arm does not go behind his knee, but rather drops very low underneath the hip. And I want to grab his gi, or even better, his belt. My upper hand, typically we're going to grab a handful of uniform here, and we're going to hold him very, very tight, just like this. It's important that I put pressure with my chest, but also that I keep my head in tight and low. Let's see what that looks like with me facing the camera. So, knees are very wide, arm behind the neck. My other arm is very low, under the hip and I'm grabbing his belt. If I can't get that, I'll grab his, uh, his top of his gi or even the pants. So we're here and we are here. Pressure on his chest just like this, okay? Our first escape here, he's gonna simply bridge upward to make some space, shrimp on his side, and then do a guard recovery. So he uses his legs and arms to bridge up, falls on his side, shrimps away, gets his knee in between us and recovers guard, okay? So he broke the pin and established a guard position. I'm no longer getting points for pinning him down. Second one puts us in one of those chokes or arm bars that we talked about earlier. So let's just see it first and then we'll talk about it briefly. Okay. So what he's doing here is taking the knife edge of his hand forcing my neck down to trap it behind his knee. And this makes one of my arms go out perfectly straight in a position we refer to as ude gatami, the arm or shoulder arm lock. He can get an elbow lock here. If he wanted, he could also lock this foot behind his knee and execute sankaku, the triangle choke. Let's see that one. Just like that. So, those are your two pins for yellow belt and a couple of basic escape techniques from each one. Work on those. Let me know if you need any help or have any questions. Okay, guys, we're going to go over the chokes and joint locks that are required at the yellow belt rank in our adult judo curriculum here at Wall to Wall. Uh, these are pretty basic ground fighting techniques. We have two chokes and then one basic arm bar. That's in Sage W. Didier here to help me out with this. So let's just get right into it. So I'm going to have him have a seat here, and we'll do the first technique. I'll just be in the seated rear mount position. Our first choke is uh, what we refer to as Hadaka Jame, uh, which just means the naked choke or naked strangle. That simply means I am not grabbing uh, the uniform, the lapel or the sleeve or anything like that in order to execute the choke. So technically or theoretically speaking, anytime I'm choking my opponent and I'm not using part of his or my uniform, uh, that could really be considered a, a, a variation or a technique that is a Hadaka Jume. So we have a couple of ways that are acceptable for testing purposes for this technique. The first one is for my arm to go around very deep and go underneath his chin. So I've got my bicep on this side and my forearm here on this side. So one very acceptable variation or version is just to clasp my hands together, not my fingers intertwined, but in what we call a gable grip here, and then simply to close off this triangle by pulling sharply here. And that's kind of the more basic or standard or traditional way of doing the technique. Another acceptable version in judo would be to go here, place my hand inside my elbow, and then fold my arm over and put it behind his neck. My fingers may go on top of my shoulder or on top of my bicep, and I may slide that down, almost like this is a knife or a blade trying to cut through the back of his neck. 
So I'll slide it down and forward while I close off the triangle. So it may look something like this and squeeze. We could put the hand on top of the head. I don't find that to be a particularly effective version, but it is okay. The one thing that we do not do in judo um, for rule purposes and safety purposes is we do not put our hand on the back of his head and then push his head forward. Um, in judo, that would be considered a neck crank or an attempt to break the neck and it's not allowed. If you do that in a judo tournament and the referee sees it, you will be disqualified from the match. So remember, it would be okay to have the hand on top or the arm completely behind the neck at the base of his neck, but never on the back of his head and pushing his head forward. So that's Hadaka Jume, naked choke or strangle. Our next one is when our opponent is on his hands and knees. I'm gonna have him with his head toward you guys. This could be from a failed throwing attempt. Maybe we were in stand-up and he attempted a drop knee shoulder throw and I was able to spin to the side here and not get thrown over. So in that case, I already had this thumb inside his lapel. It's already in the position I need to work for this next choke, okay? So we are here. This technique we call koshi or goshi jame, and it means the hip choke or hip strangle. So I've got the thumb inside his lapel. I slide it up nice and deep right beside his neck. My other arm, I'm gonna slide it so that my forearm goes right against the side of his neck. And I'll put my hand here on the mat. Now, I'm partially doing this so that I can control this technique and do it slow and safe. Your hand doesn't really have to touch the ground to execute the technique. It may just go here as I'm pulling and that would be fine. So we place the hand down so now I can control it as I step my left foot through and place my left hip on his shoulder. And I push with the hip and pull with my right hand here to execute, execute this choke. So my right hand is pulling across and under his neck and my left hip is push, 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 push on this shoulder. So the hip into the shoulder is why we call it the hip choke or hip strangle, Koshi Jame. Let's see that one last time. Thumb in deep, slide the hand by. The forearm needs to be actually making contact with the side of his neck, not out here on his shoulder. In very deep, sit through and push with your hip as you pull with the right hand. So those are your two choking techniques. We have one arm bar or joint lock for this series. It's Udi Hishigi Jujigatami. In your uh, handbook or cheat sheets, we have shortened that and we simply call it Jujigatami. This means the cross body arm lock. We're gonna see it at the yellow belt level primarily just being done from a guard position. Okay, so I'm on my back. Here, and my opponent is in my full or closed guard. So I'm gonna control or, or trap his arm here to my center line. And I usually think about trying to put their elbow on my belly button or on my belt knot. And I'll put the foot on the same side onto his hip. That knee, we don't want it to be open. We wanna close that in against his shoulder. It's gonna make it harder for him to pull this arm free. If the knee is out wide, he's wide open to pull his arm free, but when I close this in, it, it kind of helps me maintain control. The first version of this, we simply slide this leg up under his armpit as we turn to the side. So I've created an angle. Now I'm looking at the side of his head, not the front, and I'm able to bring this leg over, squeeze my knees together. I could finish this by pulling on his arm and by thrusting my hips up, or I could push with my legs to knock him down, slide in very close to his shoulder, squeeze my knees tight, pull his arm straight, and then a nice lift there with my hips to finish, okay? So that's a very basic version of the technique. Let's see it from this side, right here. Control, control, 
slide this leg up, up, and push with your other foot to achieve the angle. Leg over, arm bar here, or push away, slide in deep, squeeze the knees tight, and lift with the hips to finish right there. So, at the yellow belt level, uh, one of those two very basic variations of the technique is really what we're looking for. In later uh, versions, we will see uh, different ways of doing Jujigatami, and of course, as they improve or increase and move up in rank, we expect them to learn many other ways of performing this particular armbar. So those are your two chokes and your armbar for the yellow belt set. Work on those. Be sure to let me know if you have any uh, questions or need help with any of that. Okay, we are going to go over the miscellaneous mat work requirements for yellow belt in the wall-to-wall -wall, uh, adult judo curriculum. So these are meant as sort of supplementary groundwork techniques to help improve uh, overall rondori skills for people who are, we're going to assume, completely new to groundwork or to fighting on the ground. I've got Sensei John King here as my partner for this set. So we're going to have our partner turtled up. In the context of judo, particularly if we talk about Olympic or IJF style judo, turtling up is a viable defensive position. In Olympic style judo, if he turtles up real tight, I only have maybe four, five, six seconds that the referee is gonna allow me to turn him over or execute a technique. Also in judo, we don't get any points for taking the back. So if I achieve a rear mount or a seated rear mount, I'm in a superior position to get a submission, but I'm not getting any points for that. So it's a little different from Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, in freestyle Judo, it is still a viable defense to turtle up. However, we give a lot more time on the ground for me to attack or try to break open his turtle position and achieve a submission or turnover. And also, if I can successfully turn him over and establish control in freestyle judo, we get a point for that. It's one point for a turnover or breakdown, it's also referred to as. So, for freestyle judo, it's not as advisable to turtle up. However, this is still a position that you will encounter a lot in judo in general. So it is important to work on techniques defending from here and also attacking this position. So, uh, we have several techniques in this set specifically designed uh, to attack a person when they're turtled up on their hands and knees. The first one is called the cross face turnover and it works like this. I'm going to be beside him and the basic version I will reach one arm all the way across his chest and I'm going to grab his elbow very low to the ground on the opposite side. My front arm will go across right underneath his chin or right near his face, hence the term cross face. And it's also going to grab very low. I'm not grabbing here at his shoulder and bicep, tricep, grabbing at the base of his arm. My knees are out wide, my toes are on the mat, so I've got some power. Now I'm going to pull his elbows toward me to take out his base of support, and then I'm going to use my chest, kind of like a bulldozer, to push him over. So I'll pull his elbows to me, and I'll begin to push with my chest. Now, as he topples over, it's important that I get one of these arms out. Typically, the back arm is the one you want to get out, and I need to get that arm out and stop myself from being thrown completely over him. If I don't get this arm out, he will probably continue my momentum and he will roll me over, maybe even get on top and pin me. So it's very important that we do that. Let's have him face this way so we can see the position from here. One arm behind the elbow, one arm in front of the elbow. Pull and push and stop your momentum with the back hand if possible. Now, there are several perfectly acceptable variations. We may grab in front of the elbow here, and with our back hand, we might grab the leg on my side and pull it. We might grab the leg on the opposite side and pull it. It's okay. We might grab behind both legs here at his knee or here. We may do a combination of those things. Anything I can do to pull his arms out from under him and drive him over. If my front hand 
is going across his face and grabbing his elbow, it's going to be a version or variation of a cross face turnover. It's also important to have your students work on this from both sides. Okay? Our next technique is the half Nelson turnover. It's a very common wrestling technique. On your curriculum, you'll see this called half Nelson times three, or you may see half Nelson from left, right, and front. So we want to work it on both sides. It's important to remember with a half Nelson, whatever hand is by his head, that is the hand that's going to go behind his neck. So this hand and arm will go under his armpit, above his shoulder, and I will cup or grab with four fingers right behind his neck. Now, I really want to execute and exert some force here. So I'm going to push down on his neck and I'm going to lift up on his shoulder real strongly here. With my other hand, I will reach through and either grab the elbow or grab the knee, the ankle, or the near knee or ankle. My personal preference, if I can get it, is to grab the far elbow, just like in the cross face turnover. Push, lift, pull, and again, get the rear hand out to stop my momentum, otherwise he will pitch me over. So let's see that with him facing the camera. Front hand, under the armpit, behind the neck, drive his head down and lift his shoulder up, grab the far elbow, pull it out, push, 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 and stop yourself from being thrown across him. We would want to work on that from both sides. Remember, the hand nearest his head is the one that goes under the armpit. When we do half Nelson from the front, things change a little bit. So in this case, we could maybe imagine an example where he went in for a double leg takedown and I was able to sprawl and defeat his attempted throw. From here, I would grab his belt and I would put my elbow and forearm down the center of his back. Now my other arm goes on top of his shoulder, under his armpit, grabs my own wrist. Now to generate power, I won't stay here. Instead, I'm going to step to the side, pivot across. Now I'm in a very powerful lifting and pushing position. I'm going to push down on his neck and between his shoulder blades with my elbow and forearm and I'm going to lift strongly here and I'm going to drive him all the way over probably holding on to the belt here as part of my pin this modified chest hold or side control position let's see that one one more time grab the belt forearm on the back over the shoulder under the armpit step pivot and drive strongly across into a pinning technique. Our next technique for miscellaneous mat work is a standard scissor sweep when he is in my guard. Lots of acceptable variations. This can be standard sleeve and lapel, can be two on one, it can be double sleeve control, whatever you like. I typically teach it to beginners here and here. It's just important that they remember they can't allow this arm freedom of movement. If it's free to move wherever it wants, when I sweep him, he puts it down and stops my sweep. So we want to control that arm. I'm going to use my feet and hips to move out, turn to my side, put my knee on one side of his body, my foot on the other, so my shin is in the center of his chest. I'm going to pull him strongly up toward me, drop my leg. Now my leg slides at his base and my upper leg straightens or kicks out here. And I want to follow that up into a controlling position. So let's see that again with us facing this direction. Particularly important for bigger adults, taller guys like me, they have to sometimes make some space to get their leg across. So I like to use my feet and my hips to push my body out and turn to my side. Now I've got lots of room to bring my leg into position. Pull him strongly toward you. You can't allow him to settle back into his hips. The technique won't work. You're going to have to do something else. So pull him up tall. Now sweep low and kick. And remember to follow it up top. 
We do a variation of that in this set called the knee push scissor sweep. We're assuming that our partner has enough ground knowledge and training to establish a very wide low base when he's in my guard. So from here, again, I make space, get my leg into position. But now because of his wide base, my sweep isn't working. I'm gonna place my foot on the front of his knee, very, very low. My toe, baby toe, little toe, is touching the mat here. I'm gonna push straight back to break his base on that side. Now I will kick here. And again, I wanna follow that up top. So we refer to that as the knee push scissor sweep. Our last technique for this set is what we refer to as a hip bump. Very, very simple guard sweeping technique. From here, I wanna get control of one of his arms. Maybe it's on my body here, so I grab the gi, pull it out to the side. Maybe he's sitting up, so I grab him and I pull him down real hard and he catches himself. I'm gonna trap his wrist and sit up and over. This would be very much like doing an arm bar, but instead I trap the wrist, wrap over, and I like to grab here at his forearm and elbow area. Then I can release with my left hand, lift my body up, and I'm gonna wrap this arm into my body as I bump here to get on top. Let's see that with our heads toward the camera. Trap, control, wrap his arm into your body and bump here into a controlled position. So those are your miscellaneous mat work techniques for yellow belt. Remember whenever possible work all of those techniques on both sides. Thanks a lot, work on it. Let us know if you have any questions or need help with anything. Okay guys, we're gonna go over the counters and defenses and the combinations for yellow belt in our senior judo curriculum. Uh, the first one, uh, counter and defense, will be when our opponent attacks with Ogoshi, the large hip throw, and we're gonna counter with what we call an inside cut to a forward throw. So basically, I'm gonna step around and get my hips in front of his hips and then throw him with a forward throw, most likely uh, something like Kubinagi, the neck throw. So let's see what this one looks like. see that from the other side. So the real important thing here is as he attacks, I can't stay behind his hips. I need to step out and then cut back inside and get my hips in front of his hips. In this case, I put my arm around his neck, blocked his leg with my leg, and threw a left-sided kubinagi or neck throw. Our next one is Osoto Gari as the main attack, and our counter is Osoto Gaishi, the large outer reversal. key point there is as your opponent attacks your lead leg for Osoto Gari, instead of resisting forward and trying to power through, I'm going to step back with my supporting leg here, my left leg, and change the direction of off balance. I'm going to step and then head down, and now I can reap his leg with my own Osoto Gari, making it Osoto Gaishi, the large outer reversal. Next will be Ipon Sayanagi, and we're going to counter with a hip block. We're going to show two different ways of doing that. And the second version. So the important thing here is that I'm stopping him from getting in close enough to create off balance. The first time is by using my hand here on his hip or the small of his back, but I'm not gonna stay behind him. As he continues to try to move in, I have to move around him, not stay behind his hips. Now the second version is simply to use my hip to block his. As he enters, I'm gonna simply twist or pivot here and hit his hip with mine, and then almost bounce off to step around. So a simple hip block, either of those two versions is fine. Just remember to get around your opponent, not stay behind them. Many times if you stay behind their hips, they can throw you with something else. Next one will be 
Seoi Otoshi, the drop knee shoulder throw. Our defense or counter for this is for me to sprawl and move my legs around to the side and then finish with Koshi Jume, the hip choke you saw earlier in this segment uh, on the yellow belt choking techniques. Again, with that throw, very important that I don't try to stay behind him and think I can ride out his forward momentum. I'm getting my legs out to the side and then I'm circling around and bleeding off some of his forward pull, his forward energy by turning it into a bigger circle, then moving in for the choking technique. Last one for this set of counters and defenses is the double leg takedown or Marote Gari. We're gonna do a sprawl and then move to the side and go into a turnover to a pin. The simplest one here would be maybe um, cross-face turnover or half Nelson. We'll do a cross-face turnover in this particular demonstration. So with any uh, double leg takedown for this basic defense, the biggest thing is to sprawl really strong kick both legs back and put force down on my opponent if he ends up on hands and knees. Pretty easy to go into a cross face or elbow and knee or half Nelson turnover. So those are the counters and defenses for the yellow belt set. Let's go ahead and look at the combinations throw to throw. First one I'm going to attack with Ipon Sayanagi. When my opponent resists by pulling back, I'm going to transition into Osotogari, the large outer reap. So, I attack with Ipon Sayanagi. His reaction is to pull back to avoid me throwing him forward. I'm going to keep my head down, trap or wrap around his leg, and then hop to throw the Osoto Gari. Our next one is going to be Osoto Gari transitioning into Osoto Makikomi. So from this grip, I attempt an Osoto Gari but he's resisting strongly forward. I'm gonna release his lapel with my right hand, grab his belt over his shoulder, head stays tucked. Now I make a series of small hops to get my left foot behind his right foot. And then reap and wrap simultaneously with my upper body. So reap and wrap at the same time. Now when you're practicing this with your partners, remember, to be a little cautious about how hard you land into their rib cage, you'll notice I sort of caught myself here on my forearm and elbow instead of having my partner absorb all of that energy. Uh, if we're doing this for real and we need to throw as hard as possible, we would make our opponent feel the brunt of the force. When we're practicing with our buddies, we want to take good care of them, so I purposely moved my body out a little bit off of his torso and I caught myself here so that I didn't put the full force of the throw into his rib cage. All right, so we also have in this segment two throws to a pin. What that means is you can pick any two throws from the yellow belt set, demonstrate the throw, and then immediately go into a pin. I'm just going to demonstrate one for, so that you guys will kind of understand what we're looking for. When you're demoing these for promotion, just understand it's okay to throw your partner and give them just a second to make a safe landing before you go into the throw. So for example, maybe I was going to do Osoto Gari into Kesa Gatami. And let him land first and then go immediately into Kesa Gatami. I don't have to fall on him as if it were a live competition match or something like that and therefore uh, not beat my partner quite so much.